Hello, everyone. We will wait for our participants to come into our Zoom. We are allowing the attendees to populate our Zoom webinar. We'll begin in just a moment. Welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Alicia Cohen. I'm the director of the Hubbard School of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of Minnesota. I'm delighted to be here today with several panelists. I'll start with Scott Libin, who is our Hubbard School, our Hubbard Senior Fellow um, here at the Hubbard School, who teaches courses in um, multimedia journalism, production classes, and others. And um, is, he organized this panel along with uh, peers um, in the industry. So Julie Nelson we have from CARE 11, Tom Avilis from uh, WCCO, as well as Norman Seawright from WCCO today. I want to say that this event is actually the fourth in a series of town hall events hosted by the Hubbard School on the rights and responsibilities of journalists um, during this time. Today is the beginning of a conversation around live broadcasting, uh, but we expect to be many, um, there might be many questions that remain um, that we'll take up with other uh, broadcasters from the region in the weeks and months ahead as part of our town hall series. As the host of the event, I wanna go over a few logistics uh, for those of you who might be new to um, the webinar uh, experience. Uh, first, um, this is a secure webinar that is being recorded. We plan to upload this recording to our website and social media in the next week um, that, so that you and others might watch it um, and share with others. Second, our panelists will be talking for about 20 minutes or so um, on questions that Scott Libid has prepared for them. But we really are very interested in taking questions um, by, uh, from you, from members of the audience. And so I wanna let you know how you can do that. Um, to do so, just look down at your Zoom um, meeting uh, down by the participant button um, and then go over a few to Q&A. If you click that box, Q&A box um, on your screen, you can uh, type in questions for the panelists. Um, only the panelists will see your questions. We will select those um, that we can to answer live. Um, you can um, do so with your name or anonymously, whatever makes you the most comfortable. You also note, unlike many Zooms, there's no chat function available. That's so that we can focus uh, clearly on the uh, panelists uh, here. Um, we wanna focus the questions that you have. And uh, without uh, further ado then, I will introduce uh, Scott Lemon, who can uh, introduce uh, the panelists further in the topics for conversation. Thank you, Scott, for joining me today. Thanks, Alicia, and thanks to my uh, two old friends, Tom and Julie, and my new friend, Norman, uh, for lending their expertise to our conversation today. I want to start, Tom Avilas, with you. Um, you actually uh, were talking a little bit about the unique challenge of covering protests and unrest um, live, which will be our function today, but also in the era of a pandemic. And I wonder, uh, you know, how you're doing and what, what sort of your most powerful thoughts and takeaways are from this experience so far. Well, Scott, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. It's good to be here this afternoon. Um, I know that we were just talking a little bit earlier. I am sitting at home because I'm waiting the results of a COVID test, uh, which I was basically, I was, the station wanted me to have it because I was sitting in the back of a police van with 10 other people who were coughing. So that's obviously a very uh, unique thing when it comes to protests, basically having to realize that there's also a pandemic going on. So that, for me, that was the, the most surreal case is just having to deal with your health uh, physically and also uh, emotionally and mentally when it comes to dealing with all these different events that we have going on in our world today. Uh, covering the protests, I was actually out of town for the majority of the early protests and on Saturday when I was arrested during the protest, I just got back from vacation and uh, I was covering, I was embedded with the protesters and I was the pool camera for, I believe, CARE ourselves, WCCO TV, and also for Fox 9. And when the march started, 
I was confronted by police and I was with a producer, Joan Gilbertson. And that's when we were both uh, basically told to leave and I was arrested after I did not leave the location. So uh, still a little tired after everything that's gone on, but it's definitely been a whirlwind. And for me, I've covered a lot of protests in my life. I've, uh, I've covered, you know, embedded in the war in Iraq. I have covered protests in Cairo, covered uh, incidents like the refugee camps in Syria. So I've been to a lot of very, uh, how can I say, very tense places throughout the world. And the one day I did spend in Minneapolis this past two Saturdays ago was by far the most chaotic news situation that I've ever covered. And it, it definitely, it definitely was something which I know I'll never forget and all the journalists who covered it won't, won't forget it at all. Well, we'll come back to some of those particular memories, Tom. I, I, I know um, many people are most familiar with you uh, for the longer form enterprise package storytelling that you've done so powerfully over the years. And I'm interested in how that sort of informs your work in a live environment, but we'll come back to you for that. We'll do a, a sort of lightning round here first and move on to Norman Seawright of WCCO. Norman, thank you again. Um, we have not worked together. I, I am a former colleague of, of both Tom's and Julie's, but I'm a viewer of you, Norman, and I had become accustomed to seeing you covering a very different beat. Yes. Um, you're a sports journalist by mm -hmm. specialty, and I looked up one day and saw you um, in an environment that was uh, not not fun and games, and, and I would mm -hmm. say quite different. But would you talk a little bit about uh, how you found yourself doing this very different kind of reporting and and what that was like for you? Of course. Well, yeah, I was actually like Tom was off for the early parts of this. Um, I just taken some, some, uh, some planned time away just to kind of reset myself after doing a lot of the coronavirus level stories and sports, which tend to range from how are people coping to how are the players adjusting? What are they doing to when will they start playing again? Will they start playing again? Um, but then when I saw this happen, um, a few things happened right away. You know, when I first saw how George Floyd was killed, um, that ended up stacking a compounding for me between Ahmaud Arbery uh, murder, between uh, the situation that happened in Central Park, all three of those things happening in such short proximity to each other uh, took a huge toll on me, you know, mentally, emotionally. I sort of shut down for a day. You know, my agent call was like, what are you doing? How are you getting in on this? I'm like, let me process it first. And then um, and then I called up the station. I was like, all right, I'm ready. Go ahead, put me on this. Like, I know you're going to do it anyway, but I'm telling you I'm ready to do it. Um, and that was it, you know? And they, they've been very uh, targeted with the way they've used me in this. Um, obviously, we do do the breaking situations as well. Um, but I'm also um, able to go and find some of the good you know, to, to give the more human level story, the uh, kind of display a little bit of heart when it comes to the people at uh, the center of this. You know, I, I've been fortunate for that. I've been fortunate to be able to do that. Um, and I think that kind of stems from the way I want to do sports anyway. Like I'm not really X's and O's for focus there. I'm a little bit more um, interested in the way people operate, you know, as, as human beings. So Seeing this on a macro level um, is, is something that I, I've been very um, keen on. Well, I want to hear a lot more about it, and, and I'm really grateful for your point of view. Um, let's talk with Julie Nelson for a moment. Julie, um, you were not in the field for this, but you were in the studio. And as uh, I was not the first to say, but I mentioned to you in a conversation recently, these are the moments uh, when anchors really earn their paychecks, right? This is not about reading off a teleprompter with, you know, which with training anybody can do under ideal circumstances. But this is uh, an occasion where you really have to think on your feet and, and there's very little editorial filter outside your own head. Um, tell us a little bit about how this challenge fits into the range of your experience over the years. 
Well, I don't have the kind of international experience that Tom has, that's for sure. But I have been through uh, very passionate and violent protests here before. Um, and as this started to unfold, what struck me was how rapidly things escalated. So we were watching it and it seemed as if there was some unrest, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't clear how widespread it was for a while. And um, when we went on the air, it was clear that this was something that we had never experienced before, at least in my lifetime in the Twin Cities. I would say in those moments, I, I so appreciate the crews, the Toms and the Normans of the world that are, that are actually in the thick of it because there were some scary times. We didn't have security for our crews until probably Saturday. So if you recall, Thursday and Friday were very frightening. Uh, there was very little law enforcement pres presence. There was a lot of things that were unfolding live on the air that were criminal in nature. No one knew how these crowds were gonna react and, and Tom and Norman can speak better uh, of their experience to how these crowds did react to media and to law enforcement. Uh, but it was a scary, it was scary to watch people that you care about, that you love, who are on your team, putting themselves in those situations. And yet in order to tell the story, you needed to have people in those situations. We did as much as we could from Sky 11, our chopper from a safe distance, but the story really, as everyone saw, unfolds on the ground. So it's important to, in my opinion, to know your community, to have some history, and in those moments, be able to call on the knowledge you have of your town and the politicians and the neighborhoods and I was very glad I wasn't brand new to the market when this whole thing unfolded. I thought it was important to have perspective on this. I think you did call at one point on leaders actually to, to come forward and, and you know, speak and even to contact the station, right? I did. Uh, Thursday night, we were, and, and as anyone, Anchors in this situation, you rely on the team behind you to get people on the phone for you, to let you know where the crews are, who's safe, who you can go to. So while we're broadcasting live, we're having a constant conversation via text uh, and through our IFBs with our producers. And I was texting them saying, where are the, where's the mayor, where's the governor? And they kept texting back saying, we're trying, we're trying, we're trying, they're not responding. And we have the cell phone numbers of, of sometimes the officials themselves, but certainly their number one person who was with them at the time. So we knew they were getting the messages, they were just not responding. This is not to say that they were not busy. I'm sure they were completely overwhelmed. But as I watched the absolute, it really turned into chaos unfolding to not know, and, and everyone on the ground, everyone we could hear from, everything I saw on social media, no one saw law enforcement anywhere. And so, I just started to call out publicly, Governor, please call us. Our viewers want to know what the plan is. We need to know what the plan is. Is there help coming for these, these people in these neighborhoods? What is your plan? Um, and both Thursday and Friday, because if everyone recalls, it was about 1.30 in the morning, the governor came on the air and basically said, or he came on and did his press conference and said, this was in the hands of the mayors and now it's in my hands. Now this is a state matter. We are going to get this under control. So he was reassuring everyone. He said we were overwhelmed, we were not prepared, but now it's my call to make. And so tomorrow this will be under control. And we can talk about that press conference later. That was also unprecedented. I had never seen a press conference like that before. So when things started to unfold again on Friday in exactly the same way after the sun went down, um, that's when I have been the most editorial I've ever been on air, the most emotional I've ever been on air, but I did feel it was my job to speak for viewers who were wondering the same thing I was, which was, how is this happening again? We thought this was under control. Somebody please tell us what the plan is here. Good, well, thank you. I mean, it's, that's helpful insight, and, and I wanna come back to you for more on that. Norman, um, I think you said it was a couple of days in 
um, for, farther into the, the events that unfolded before you became live, involved live in the field. Um, what were your impressions and, and what are your most memorable moments now from that experience? What is it you learned um, either that you were able to convey to your audience at the time or that upon reflection, you want people to understand about what you experienced out there? One thing that I learned, um, and while I do have a lot of experience with Minnesota, like actually five, six years back, I was an intern at CARE 11. Um, I worked in Duluth for about a year and a half before moving on to West Virginia and now coming back. I think one thing that I, I've been able to sort of reflect on and, and maybe challenge a little bit is, is the way Minnesota views itself as a very nice place with very good people. Um, but without paying too much attention to what lies beneath the surface of it, right? Like the, the system that allowed for what happened to happen again and again and again exist everywhere. And because we were all stuck indoors, because we did not have sports to entertain and distract us, because we did not have anything in the way, we were forced to confront all of this head on to say, okay, this is not right in our society and we're upset about it. And that was something I saw over and over and over again, being out in the field, being out talking to people and just observing the way people are going about things. And, you know, again, I'm not, not being from here. People noticed that. And, you know, I, I had been confronted once by, um, by a gentleman who was like, you know, we, we know how media does and, and we don't want you to be that. And, which I sort of understood. Um, he was also black. Um, and what I think he meant by that, when people talk about the way media does things, I think they look more at the national, the, the, the cable groups. And they're, they're less um, critical when it comes to local. But they wanted to be represented properly. They wanted to be represented fairly. And I made it a point um, Everyone I spoke to, I was like, let me make sure I get as many black voices as possible uh, because these are the people most directly affected here. These are the people whose voices need to be heard. And while black Americans cannot shoulder the entirety of this burden, it is important that their perspective is given on this. So most memorably, yeah, I mean, I spoke with um, the father of Mike Brown when he came into town. Um, I spoken with Philando Castile's mother. I uh, spoke with a cousin of Emmett Till, um, both of those as recently as a few days ago. And it's just like, you could tell like we're upset, but we're also tired that this sort of thing continues to happen. And I'm, and I'm right there with them. I'm like, yeah, I am too. You know, I'm, and it, it took a lot. It's taken a lot for me to, to do my best to compartmentalize this where I am also, I'm working, I'm informing people and giving what needs to be given. But at the same time, I'm feeling all of it too. Cause I'm like, man, George Floyd, that could have been me for no reason. So that's, that's where I've been. So I want to come back to that specifically, that, that notion of how you manage your own life experience in this. Okay. We'll, we'll give you a minute to think more about that while we go to Tom again for a second, but that's really important. And, and as I'm sure everybody in this conversation knows, that's a very active issue in the craft of journalism right now. And I think that's going to be an ongoing conversation. I'm interested in your take on it. Tom, you have, um, so you, you came into this uh, almost a week after the death of George Floyd, came back from vacation, I think you said. And, uh, and it was your first night out there that you were struck, I think, by a rubber bullet. Uh, as you mentioned, you ended up in the back of a police van. Um, not to, uh, you know, drag out ancient history here, but you've, you've had, to my knowledge, one other uh, arrest under similar circumstances covering uh, the 2008 Republican National Convention and some of the protests outside of that. I remember that night vividly and the phone call that I got uh, about your brief uh, arrest. I don't know how this compared with that. And I'm, I guess I'm partly interested in, in your perspective on it. That was 12 years ago. Uh, both were 
rapidly unfolding situations. Um, I don't believe you were a pool camera in that first instance, but you, you were in this, right? What, what, what were some of the other similarities or differences? You know, the similarities in both 2008 during the Republican National Convention and the most recent, uh, this was last Saturday night that I was arrested, was just the chaotic nature of both events. Uh, it was two groups, you know, one obviously very upset uh, because of what happened or was happening back in 2008. It was the war in Iraq, which was uh, on many people's mind, uh, currently obviously because of the death of George Floyd. And you had two sides that were, you know, very, you know, emotionally invested. And I know that in 2008, it just seemed to me that things were a little bit more organized on the behalf of the police. The police basically what they did was they rounded us up and they kind of forced the protesters on a bridge. And I was embedded with the protesters and with Heather Brown, reporter anchor at WCCO. And that's basically the way it went down there. It was very organized and slowly pushed us to the bridge. In this case, it was, it was, like I say, it was extremely chaotic. We were following the protesters for a matter of minutes. And then out of nowhere, the police just came sweeping around the corner and the protesters started running. And when they approached us, uh, you could see that they were, uh, they were very, you know, the police were very emotional. They're like, you know, I basically just said, hey, I'm with WCCO. But, you know, they were, they were like, you got to get out of here. You got to get out of here. And I understood from my previous event that, you know, when the police say something, you do it. Unfortunately, I was attached to Joan Gilbertson. She was in the car on the street, which they were shooting with rubber bullets. And they probably just thought she was a protest or something. So I, I'm not going to leave my producer behind. So I kept on saying, hey, that's my producer. And that's why I was arrested, because I did not back down. They gave me the opportunity to leave. They saw, after they shot me, they saw that I was with WCCO and they told me to leave. But I didn't leave because, like I say, I, didn't, I wasn't going to leave my coworker. And that's how that unfolded. Both situations were very heated, but this one is definitely on a different level. I mean, 2020, this, this is definitely, like I said, like Julie said, like Norman said, it's unlike anything any of us have ever covered. And it, the, the stress is just palpable. It's like the humidity yesterday. It's just, it's in the air and you really just can't get away from it. And certainly, you know, all of us who were in the market at the time remember the planning and uh, and lead up to the, you know, an event like a, a national political convention is fundamentally different. Everybody knows it's going to happen. It's really not breaking news. Uh, it was easy to predict the sort of activity that would go on around it. And I, I, I gather from your impression, the police were much more prepared for that than they were uh, for what happened in the aftermath of, of George Floyd's death. Fundamentally different triggering mechanisms, obviously, in, in very different circumstances. So Norman, let me, let me come back to you um, on that issue that you raised briefly, and that is this notion of the role of your own perspective, your own point of view, your own life experience, um, and how it informs your work as a journalist, especially, to, to remind everybody of our focus here today, in a live unedited environment. Uh, you're not running your words past anybody for script approval um, you know, you're not recording this in an audio booth somewhere, you know, what you decide to say is on its way out to a, a very engaged, very interested audience. Mm -hmm. how, how do you um, manage your own beliefs, uh, your own interpretations to how do they inform your work? I've been very careful um, over the years to learn how to measure responses. So um, I would, I fell back on that a lot. Um, but at the same time, like whatever emotion I'm able to convey while I'm on air, I made sure that it wasn't mine um, at, in that moment. What I mean by this is where I'm standing near a, a group of protesters who are, I think this, yeah, the day, the, the incident on I-35 where, yeah. where the truck came through there. Yeah. Um, I'm up there next to protesters in the aftermath of that and you know, I'm able to convey what they're feeling because I was with them in the morning. You know, I'd left and come back. So I knew what was going on. I knew what was planned. I knew, obviously, what had happened and then uh, the reaction to that. But, uh, man, to approach this, um, 
knowing again that this this is uh this is an issue that yes directly affects me a human being um it's not easy and you know we've i've, I've talked about this a little while ago with in another uh, webinar the notion of the objectivity in this i think it's hard to establish it almost totally goes out the window on this because you're like man yeah you could talk about both sides of an issue like this but one of those sides if you want to give it that credence is not um it, it more or less fundamentally disregards the human rights of an entire group of people and again i have to put that in the back of my mind because i can't just be you know saying these things um unchecked but at the same time yeah like th these are these are real issues affecting real people it's it's human it's emotional it's tough to watch it's tough to deal with and um but yeah, i make sure, absolute sure to take the time to maintain myself mentally on this because while yeah i relate i identify um which does help me make those conversations a little bit more fluid when i talk to people out in the public about this and in live situations um, it, it does help me control those interviews um, and then keep them from becoming um too emotional mm -hmm. you know to the point where it's uh i don't want to hold it back but I, I definitely don't let it go off the rails you know what i mean like let it get out of hand let it go into areas where it doesn't need to be so a lot of practice is, is the short answer there it's a lot of practice that that's that comes with um understanding your personal experience with all of this but also not letting it drive you you kind of drive it i can't imagine i'm the only viewer you know who felt that this is a more complex story than the old-fashioned two sides approach anyway and in fact it's my personal uh belief i'll in the spirit of disclosure say this that that the two sides to every story model is a dangerous one it's a simplistic i think usually false dichotomy there are a lot of sides to this story and each of you probably saw a number of them uh, there are some broad issues but there are a lot of perspectives there are a lot of points of view there are a lot of stories to be told within this and i i think you know when we think of balance we probably shouldn't think of the scales of justice but something more like a gyroscope with you know right. 360 degrees of, of balance yeah you, and it's you know, hard because like when you and i've had these conversations with people who are upset about like well where they're, they're destroying things how is this going to solve the problem and you weigh that and you're like yes this like i've had friends who've had businesses destroyed here too i i feel for them and at the same time they are the ones saying people are doing this 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 level of uprising of an unrest happens because people are not listening to them otherwise and that's even a tough conversation to have it is and one of the concerns i have about coverage especially in the moment and you you know the three of you are here because i think you did it exceptionally well um but sometimes we conflate terms I, I don't believe that protesting and rioting are the same thing. I, I don't necessarily assume that the people I see speaking and carrying signs are the same people I see breaking windows and carrying things out. Um, to what extent do you think those distinctions came across in coverage? They're kind of muddy. And I mean, they're where it would be naive to assume that there is no overlap. But as you said, largely, it's not the same thing. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a messy thing. I think the distinction does need to be made uh, by and large. You know, nobody really wants to see, you know, wanton destruction. Nobody really wants that. But also nobody really wants to uh, live in a world where they could be killed for no reason. So th those are hard things to balance. We're gonna to get to questions in a moment. Um, Julie, I, I wanna ask you about that same uh, moment though on the bridge involving the tanker. Um, I saw that 
live with my uh, 11 year old daughter. And I can say as somebody miles away at no risk, no personal risk, it was a really uh, troubling thing to see unfold. And, you know, my uh, memory, you know, flooded back of, of Reginald Denny in the aftermath of, of Rodney King's beating. We just didn't know what was happening. And there is the potential for so much immediate misinformation, some of it disinformation, possibly, right? Misinformation to me just means it's wrong. Disinformation implies something deceptive, something intentionally wrong. So sitting in the studio live watching this with not much more information than those of us in the audience, um, can you tell us a little bit about how you make decisions on the fly in that case? Well, I have to say that it is very difficult not to speculate when you have something like that happening live and we were watching it live with all of you. So as for how much more information we had than you, none. Uh, we saw this truck come through thousands of protesters on the interstate, an interstate that we had been told by state officials would be shut down by 5 p.m. And this happened at about 545. So we were operating under the assumption that this driver had to have gone around a barricade. Because if you recall, MnDOT put out the notice that once again, interstates are going to be closed, but tonight we're closing them at five. So initially we were operating under the assumption and couching it saying, we're assuming he had to have gone around some sort of barricade to have even gotten onto the interstate at this point. Um, we were hearing from people almost immediately when we started interviewing eyewitnesses. Boyd Hooper had happened to be on a parking garage roof with people who'd been watching the protesters. And so as the story started to unfold, we understood that he'd been, he'd been laying on his horn the whole time. Randy Shaver said live, right after the incident had happened, if he had wanted to kill people, he could have. All he had to do was turn his steering wheel, but he didn't. So Randy was questioning this. Um, at the same time, we're trying to get our chopper to fly back, which show us where the barricade is, what happened. And right after it came to a stop, trying to make sure we didn't show a man beaten to death live on the air. Uh, so there were lots of things going through our head. We could tell that the cab had opened to the semi. We could tell that the driver had been pulled out. Uh, we ended up having a very emotional interview with one of the young men who'd been protesting who said, this whole thing started with tragedy, with George Floyd dying. We didn't want it to end with another person dying. We wanted to make sure that he got to law enforcement and that that, that process took its course. So if those of you who aren't familiar, there were protesters that ended up gathering around the driver and protecting him until police could arrive. And it was the most harrowing thing I've ever seen unfold live with the exception of what happened Thursday and Friday night. Um, but just to watch it play out live and the fear that we had that this was gonna end in an incredibly ugly way and the fear that this was done on purpose, which uh, Norman has emotions I can't even begin to understand watching all of this unfold. But just as any human being watching that unfold live on the air, I mean, you are definitely flooded with emotion and trying to keep it in check and doing your best not to speculate, to simply say, this is what we know, this is what we've been told uh, until you can get more information. And I will tell you, we were talking about, um, about the different perspectives in the story. And Scott, you know, I agree with you. I, I think uh, the older I get, the more experienced I get, the more mature that I become, the more I realize there are hardly any issues that are truly dichotomies. Things are always more complex than people want to make them. And this was one of those situations. On social media, people were immediately coming after Randy for saying that this was maybe not intentional and saying things like, if you take the side of that truck driver, well, I guess we know what side you're on. And he most definitely wasn't taking a side. He was making an observation that this really could have been bad. All he had to do is turn his wheel. Why was he, you know, on the horn? And I, I think we, we need to consider the role of social media in this entire story. Because on social media, you will find people that say, you either agree with me 100% or you are on the wrong side. And as, a, as an anchor, I think I have a unique perspective on that because so many people voice their opinions to me. 
and I was proud of the way we handled it. Uh, it was almost incredulous when the governor came out and the um, Harrington, who's the head of public safety, and said, we actually don't think this was on purpose. And in my opinion, there's more reporting here that needs to be done. Why wasn't that interstate closed? Authorities had the protesters route. They knew they were going to be going onto the interstate for a period of time. So there are questions that still need to be answered. But I think for young journalists or people that want to get into this field or anyone who engages on social media, the lessons here are take a minute, gather facts, try not to let emotions get the best of you, uh, and just wait until you know more before you weigh in. And speculation for a journalist live is the worst thing you can do. Yep. Speaking of questions, um, we've got a couple, and I'm going to read one from Dave Thurkelson about television logistics. Um, Dave asks, uh, you know, this was a, an 18-hour, if not longer, a day story for several days, obviously. So how did news management decide anchor, reporter, and photographer scheduling? Brand considerations, you know, might call for having main anchors out there in front of the camera at every moment possible. Uh, but just like first responders, they need distance too. And we saw some of the key reporters on air early and late. How did this work? Um, did you all have a voice in when and how you were deployed? Julie, we'll start with you and then let's go back to Norman and Tom on that one. Well, I think, I know everyone at CARE 11 wanted to be there. That This was not a question of, uh, they're making me stay and I want to go home. I, I, I think we love this community. We, this is the moment that your viewers, if you are the brand, that's the way you want to put it. They have a relationship with you and they trust you. And that's why they're watching you and they want to see you. One of the most common comments I got was, thank you so much. It was comforting just to have your voice on the air. And it's because I've been here a long time and people have a relationship with me. And I know it's the same thing for Frank and Amelia, the people who watch them, they, they, they have a relationship with them and it's, and it's reassuring to know that they're there that night. I was actually supposed to be off um, on a furlough last week, and I was supposed to be on vacation for my daughter's graduation, which obviously didn't happen on the 29th when all this happened. And there's never, there was no question that there was no way I was going to be anywhere but at CARE 11, because it's, it's too important to not be there. And uh, as far as the crews in the field at CARE, we had so many people volunteering to go out that they had to make decisions based on who now has experience down there, how many security teams do we have, how many people can we send out because so many reporters and photographers were saying, put me in, I want, I want to cover this story. Norman, I, I want you to respond to this as well, but first let me share a related question uh, from my colleague Jane Kirtley who says, you know, she was fascinated by WCCO's decision to use Mike Max and you, two sports reporters, on the street in a story that was not about sports. So what are the considerations uh, from your perspective of, on using sports reporters as breaking news reporters? That's a good question. And I think this, again, goes back to the way I view sports journalism. Um, I view it as community journalism because everyone is interested in this in a way it, it's one of those great unifying features of our society so when we're doing these things or we're talking about sports we're doing it in a way that tends to uh, provide a little bit of levity to people right and when we are out there um it's i mean mike max for sure has been here for for a long time and he knows this community and he is very very well respected and he you saw the way he did this he has the connections with people to say i knew this guy back when i knew this girl back when and these connections allow him to tell this tell a much better story uh and for me it's it's a little bit of the same in in that this is this is a type of storytelling that relates back to community and with us being in there and, and i say this a lot that for sports journalists in particular, if you cannot tell a story, then you can't do sports anyway. So it's, it's all good. I mean, we we're primed for it. We're able to do it and you know, why not do it frankly? But, Thank you. 
yeah, no, to answer that question. But as far as uh, the uh, the personnel decisions, I can't speak for everybody, but like I said, I, I've told my management um, in the opening days of this, I was like, I'll do this until my body says stop. And even then we might push a little further. So I, I, I kind of agree with Julie in that. I think we all have wanted to be in this. We wanted to be there. Um, Tom Avilas, I tell my students all the time, the great majority of people who work in television news are not in front of the camera. And those people are human too, and they, they work pretty hard. Um, how, how does that work? I mean, how, how do those decisions play out? Because you're in the field, it's, this is a physically punishing job, not just when you're being shot with rubber bullets, right? Um, how, who, who makes the call and how do you know when it's time to say, not put me in coach, but maybe pull me out for a couple of plays? You know, it's, it's hard to be as eloquent and articulate as Julie and Norman, so it's tough going after those two. Uh, I just know, I, I agree 100% with what they both said, and this is a story that is history, and hopefully it's a historic event that will bring some much-needed change, and whether you're, you know, in the studio, whether you're in the in flying the drone or on the front lines, you just want to be a part of this, and I know that I looked for four days when I was out of town at, at my fellow photographers and reporters handling of this. And I was so proud from a distance to see how much work they were putting in. And I know inside me, I'm like, I have to be part of this as well, which is why I cut my trip short. But you just want to do the best job you can for your audience and for your, for your colleagues. And, you know, this is something which I know without a doubt, we're all gonna carry with us for the rest of our lives. And when it comes to knowing what to do in a certain situation, you really don't know if you're gonna do the right thing. I mean, I second guess everything that I do. You just hope that you do you know, what is the best thing for you, the people you're serving and your audience. And just to segue real quick about Mike Max, I work with Mike Max for the last, you know, after a Saturday, I worked for him for four days. And I learned so much from Mike Max, who I never worked with before, in those four days that I learned pretty much from almost anybody I've worked with. And that's to be genuine and to just respect and love everybody that you're around. And he treated the police officers no differently than the protesters, no differently than just the average person standing on the street witnessing that. And that's something I think we all can learn journalists, police, you know, protesters, just the regular citizen that just show, show love and respect to everyone you're around. And, you know, this world will be a better place. It's cliche, but that's what I learned from Mike Max. And he was, people love Mike Max. I mean, and it's, it's incredible to see how, you know, I think we've all kind of risen to a new level after this. Mike Max is a machine without an off switch too. So I don't know how he ever stops uh, the things he does, but yes. 20 cups of coffee a day, that's how he does it. <laughs> and Tom, that was so, I was so well put. So yeah, after saying you didn't know if you would speak as eloquently. Can I just jump in on that? Cause I think it's so important. I don't know who's in the audience, but if journalism students are listening to this, I think that's the most important point we can make today. You are going to be Pulled, you are going to be shamed into trying to take one narrative and run with it. You are going to be told as a journalist uh, through viewer feedback on social media that you are doing it wrong if you treat these rioters with respect. You're going to be told you're doing it wrong if you treat the police with respect. And I think what you said, Tom, is so important that these are complex stories. And we have to have respect for the people we're interviewing. We have to have, uh, we have to be the type of authentic journalists that they know they can trust us. And we are lucky in this town. We have, uh, I wish I could say CARE was the only good station, uh, but we have phenomenal competition and we have phenomenal people working in this town. And I think the reason for it is because they genuinely care about people and they show people respect. And that is the way in my opinion, that you get good stories and that you tell complete stories. So I would just caution everyone, um, social media is great, but be very careful how much feedback you believe 
you can't believe the worst, you can't believe the best, somewhere in the middle is the truth. And it's, it's only getting more important, I think, to really be centered and know who you are and where you stand and why you're there because you could just blow in the wind on stories like this. And Norman, I love that you said you took a day, you knew yourself well enough to say, I need a day to get my own head straight before I head out into this. I thought that was really powerful and important for uh, reporters to hear too. Because sometimes you feel like, well, I have to get out there right now. But the truth is if you go out there and, and you have a tripwire, it could be you know the worst thing you could do for yourself and your career. So kudos to you Norman for being that aware. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, so much of this is about imagery and video, which is at the heart of this story, right? We might be having a very difficult, different conversation if there were not video, uh, excruciating video um, of the death of George Floyd. There are also, however, uh, words uh, that deserve our attention. And there's a question from Dylan Mitten. And Dylan, I hope I didn't just butcher your last name. Um, but here's the question from Dylan. There's been a lot of discussion around the importance of language in covering protests like this. Passive voice, the terms protest versus riots, use of the word killing and, and other issues. What have discussions looked like or sounded like in your newsrooms and how do you address those concerns in instances of live shots or live tweeting? I'll open that to whoever wants to field it. That is a good one. I mean, I, I've been, I've, I've seen, I guess, every argument pro con when it comes to uh, the way we characterize George Floyd's death. Um, which, yes, it was death, but also there was something that caused it. Um, which, and this, this may be showing how new I am to the career. I'm only five or six years in, but. Um, I, it's, it's, it's hard to not look at that and say, yeah, somebody killed that man. Um, but there's a, there's a level of context that, that whatever it is that you say, it's gotta be in the proper context. You know, like I, I don't, um, I don't think it's good to be accusatory in any direction. Um, unless, you know, unless you have the filings in court to say, this is what this man's charged with. This is what's happening. This is what's going on. Because you, you run the risk of painting with too, too broad a stroke, too broad a, a brush on these things. I mean, I don't, uh, I think Julie and Tom might agree with me in this. I think that there are a lot of good people out here in the world and a lot of them do different jobs, you know, journalists, police officers, they're all there. There's no, there's no broad brush to say everyone is everyone in a particular field is bad. Um, it's just, it would be irresponsible to go that far. So it's the, the, the conversations have to be around what is the appropriate, uh, way to characterize something. What's the, what's a measured way to go about it. I want to let Tom and or Julie weigh in on that as well. But first I have to put in a shameless plug for, uh, another webinar that I'm leading tomorrow through RTDNA, the radio television digital news association. Uh, we're calling it Words Matter, the Language of Unrest, and it's all about this, Dylan. Uh, it's about the semantic issues you've raised and a whole lot more, and, and it's not designed to tell you to say this, not that. It's designed to help journalists make better decisions for themselves to uh, weigh appropriately the feedback, the pressure, um, the demands of advocates and activists all along the political spectrum and to do so consistently so that what you do for one group, you're maybe ready to do for another or not, right? So we're gonna spend an hour on that tomorrow. If you're interested, go to rtdna.com and you can sign up there. Julie, uh, Tom, any, any thoughts on that? Again, in the context of live coverage? Well, um, I would just say that we, Everything happened so quickly to be completely transparent. We didn't have a lot of discussions about what words we would use. And again, I think that's where experience is incredibly helpful. And being willing to listen to all different viewpoints. So the only uh, 
discussion we really had was early on whether we were going to call them protests or riots. But once there were multiple fires burning, I made the decision I'm calling this a riot because it had turned into the legal definition of a riot. Some people will have a problem with that. To me, there's a big difference between marching down Hennepin Avenue Bridge with signs, thousands of people and protesting, and burning down large sections of uh, businesses and ruining people's property. Um, and, and that's another instance you have to be careful on social media because everyone has an opinion. My opinion is this devolved into riots. Now, why that happened is a conversation we need to have. And calling the death of George Floyd a killing at this point, I also will say he died in police custody until that has been proven through in courts, simply because I believe we've all seen the video. We all take from it what we will. It's my job as a journalist to just, these are the absolute facts that I have in front of me right now. He died in police custody. So I am not calling it a killing. I, I know a lot of people are. There are different opinions on that. That's my opinion. I will wait until uh, those, he's convicted of a crime before uh, using those words to describe it. Uh, so I, I love that idea for a webinar tomorrow because truly I want to learn too more and I already have learned more um, about this topic because I do think this time is different in a lot of ways. It got more violent and I think it got so many more of us who are white saying, I thought I listened before. I don't know if I've really been listening. So my views could change. That's where I stand right now. To the, uh, to the earlier distinction of uh, protest and riot, I mean, here's an example of where even the best of intentions uh, can aggravate a situation. I, uh, I think, you know, if we let this become about one thing or the other, uh, and we overuse a word like protest, I worry that that does more damage to peaceful protesters who are not a part of uh, arson or looting or, or some of the other criminal activity that we saw. If we refer to that as protest, that implies that everybody out there, you know, to come together and, and grieve and speak their minds, um, that those are the people responsible. And I think that's wrong for journalists to do. I recognize that the word riot uh, conjures up a lot, of, a lot of images and a lot of ideas in the minds of people. And it has sometimes been used with racial freight or baggage. It's also been used here in Minnesota uh, to refer to something that happened out after a hockey championship, a, a hockey riot back in the early 2000s. So it's, uh, you know, the, the history of these words is, is worth contemplating. I think it's also really important we recognize that, that our language evolves. It's always evolved, right? It's always changed, but it used to take centuries or decades or years and now, because of technology and maybe specifically social media, our language changes almost day to day, which, which only ratchets up the, the difficulty of this and the importance of the decisions that you make, Julie, and that you make, Norman. And Tom, you say, I know that you don't speak for a living, uh, but you are out there um, bringing us to these events. You, you said something earlier about being the pool camera and that's a little different arrangement uh, from most coverage. Did you know when you were live? Did you know who was watching you at what time? Tell us about what that's like if you're out there shooting, not just for one television station, but I think you said maybe for three at a time. Well, yes. Uh, on Saturday, starting at two o'clock, there was demonstrations at Nicollet and Lake Street. And what it basically is, is I have, for people who are not aware, I have a backpack I wear that basically sends out the image to the other three stations. And basically each station can air whatever they want to air. So if they want to go to me live, they could use that whenever they want. I was never given cues on when people were taking me. So I basically just had to constantly give them what I felt was the best, most interesting shot of the rally. It was usually people talking and people just uh, cheering, but otherwise it's just, you're kind of on for, at least in that case, I was on for six, seven hours where I just had to always be in my mind live. So I'm live all the time. You don't get to rest because you don't know when a station's going to be using you or not. So it's, that's a, that's the thing with the new technology nowadays is used to be, you know, with live trucks, you had to move, you had a wire here. Now you're mobile. 
And that is what made this event so much different than 2008 is the fact that we were moving constantly and we're always with the protesters. We're always with the police. We're always a foot away live bringing it to our viewers. So you have to be very aware of that as well, because, you know, things get emotional. You know, I did say, uh, Jesus Christ. And my mom was very concerned when I said that she's a big Catholic. So she's like, you could have used another word when you got hit with that rubber bullet, but I didn't. So you always have to be kind of aware of what you're saying in certain situations, but it is unbelievable technology and it brings our viewers even closer, especially in an unfortunate uh, story like this. I heard that um, emission from you uh, on video um, and I'm not Catholic. So perhaps that's why I thought it could have been uh, worse in certain ways, but I respect your mom and, and, and those who, you know, would be offended by that. It's a, it's a situation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's very difficult. And, it, and so it is, we sometimes, when we talk about video, forget that it isn't, just, it isn't just pictures that move. It's sound, too. Every image has a sound with it. And mm -hmm. the use of that sound, when we have the luxury of editing, is a very powerful tool in a live environment uh, it's particularly challenging. We are running short on time, but we have a question here from Errol Solomon, another colleague of mine, uh, who says, today more people in media outlets have access to the technology to record protests and to share and stream via social media. How do you negotiate your relationship with alternative media outlets and citizen journalists, as they're sometimes called, as journalists for mainstream media organizations What's the key role that you still play in our larger media ecosystem? I don't know which of you wants to take that, but I'll <laughs> open it up to anybody who's eager to respond. Well, I mean, I've got a friend who's been on the ground in a lot of this stuff and they have a lot of video and, and a lot of perspective on this. And um, I think where we stand is, is we, as legacy journalists go, uh, we have, the platform we have the insight and and the and the training formally um, through experience or through education to put everything in larger context. But uh, as far as citizen journalists go, I mean, this is stuff that we either would not go and get or can't go and get. So there is, I, I say, there's merit to it. Good, Julie. Did you want to add anything? Yeah, I, I agree one hundred percent with Norman. We used. We vet it first, but Twitter was an invaluable tool for me because I could see video, for example, when the semi truck went down the interstate, people were uploading video and we were watching it and we were putting it on our air through technology called Tagboard uh, in, in incredibly quickly. We didn't have a photog there, but we had a lot of video from traffic cams and from people on the ground that helped us tell the story. We also put up reporters from the Minnesota Reformer on our air. This never would have happened before. We used to be very, this is our airtime, we only use our people. But with the images they were gathering and the story they were telling, I said, please, can we get Ricardo Lopez on the phone? So we used a variety of platforms. But I feel like our role as legacy journalists has never been more important because everyone can say whatever they want on social media. People should trust that we are vetting what we say, that we're careful with our words, that we are trying to tell the story from many different perspectives and give it context. And in my opinion, that's never been more important. So this whole storyline forever that uh, broadcast journalism is dead, that newspapers are dead, I think it's so important that they stay alive and stay healthy, especially in moments like this, so that there are people you can trust who are going to have some experience and they're gonna give you a measured account of what's happening. Um, We've all seen Twitter. If we rely on that for our information, we're in trouble. Thank you all. <laughs> and I'll let uh, Dr. Cohen wrap it up. We're, get, we're at the bottom of the hour. Thank you all. I appreciate each of our guests um, for partnering with us today, Julie, Tom, Norman, and thank you, Scott, for taking your time today. Um, I hope you all will consider joining us for our future panels and events. We have two terrific ones tomorrow, beginning um, at noon. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hope that you have a wonderful week ahead. Uh, stay safe. Stay, stay safe, everyone. This is why I'm not a um, live journalist, um, but I do appreciate um, your time. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you, guys.